Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode of my midweek mystery series where today we're going to be taking a look at another unsolved serial killer case commonly known as the alphabet murders or sometimes the double initial murders. Three young girls tragically lost their lives between 1971 and 1973 in Rochester, New York, all of their first names and surnames beginning with the same letter. Carmen Cologne, Wanda Walkowitz and Michelle Mayenza. Although there are a number of suspects, 50 years after the first murder, the case still remains unsolved. 10-year-old Carmen Cologne was the first victim. She was a Puerto Rican girl who lived with her grandparents in a neighbourhood called Bull's Head in southwest Rochester, a pretty working-class neighbourhood. According to the book Nightmare in Rochester, The Double Initial Murders by Donald A. Tubman and Michael Benson, Carmen's mum had been just 14 when she gave birth to Carmen by her 32-year-old brother-in-law, kind of hence why Carmen lived with her grandparents. So There's a bit more to it, but that's the basic gist. Carmen was said to have a bright smile and was always a good, well-behaved girl, but was able to stand up for herself when she needed to. And she was tiny, just 4 feet tall and 65 pounds. She attended a Catholic school and had a learning disability, which are both actually matching traits with the other two victims in this case. Although some of Carmen's delay in learning could also be attributed to the fact that there was a language barrier there, she hadn't been in America from Puerto Rico long and hadn't completely picked up the English language yet. It was the afternoon of the 16th of November 1971 when Carmen was out running an errand. She was picking up a prescription from Jack's Pharmacy on Main Street, only a couple of blocks away from her home, 10 minutes-ish walk. She was determined that day to go by herself and pick up the prescription and prove that she was a grown-up girl, but her mother actually said no three or four times before conceding and agreeing that she could. Sources differ as to whether this prescription was for her mother or grandmother or grandfather, but I suppose it doesn't really matter. Carmen left home shortly before 4.20pm wearing white trainers, a long red wool coat, green trousers and a red sweater. Usually her grandfather would watch her walk down the road or at least walk with her part of the way, but that day she didn't tell her grandfather she was going and headed off alone. When she arrived at the pharmacy, the prescription actually wasn't ready because some paperwork needed filling out, so Carmen had to wait. According to some sources, the worker at the store, a man called Jack Corbin, would later say that Carmen appeared to be in some sort of rush, saying to him, I got to go, I got to go, and so Corbin told her to come back in half an hour. She left empty-handed and never returned. It later came out that Carmen was seen by a witness getting into a parked car nearby. Her grandparents reported her as missing later that night at 7.50pm after her uncle Antonio had searched the neighbourhood to no avail. It seems to me that Carmen got speaking to somebody on her way to the pharmacy who offered her something too enticing to miss out on and so when she left she got into their car. But that of course is speculation on my behalf. The most distressing part of this story is that approximately 50 minutes after Carmen was last seen getting into the car outside the pharmacy, at least 100 different people saw a girl matching Carmen's description running down the Western Expressway, what would later become the Interstate 490. The girl was naked from the waist down, clearly distressed, frantically trying to wave down any passing vehicles, in the midst of rush hour no less and no one stopped to help. It's crazy to me that this was the 70s, a time when hitchhiking was incredibly common. People would stop and pick up strangers on the side of the road all the time, but no one stopped for a little girl. As an interview with Michael Benson, the writer of the book on AETV points out, this was a speedy expressway and by the time most people would have registered what they'd seen, they probably would have already passed it thinking they would just contact the police when they got home in a time before mobiles. It likely wouldn't have been people being malicious thinking I'm not going to stop and pick up this girl, they just wouldn't have registered it until they were already past it. And this was something that sent Rochester and all media in the general area into a spiral after the fact. Nobody could believe that not a single person stopped. 
This was a relatively safe area from what I could gather, and the fact that somebody would even snatch a child was beyond belief. But the fact that even your neighbours wouldn't stop to help was shocking. At least one witness would come forward anonymously saying that they witnessed Carmen being led back to a car by a man. And reportedly the majority of the witnesses would actually report what they saw two whole days later, only when they saw the news about Carmen's body being found. To me, this is really reminiscent of the bystander effect theory, the idea that when witnessing a crime, everyone will just assume that somebody else will be the person to help and or call the authorities. One witness who spoke to Benson and Tubman for the book said that you don't assume the worst at the time, you assume that this is a kid maybe playing after their parents, maybe after stopping at the side of the road to go to the toilet, they decided to run. You don't assume it's a child being kidnapped. Most witnesses agreed that the car on the side of the road was on the luxury end and on the larger side, so some have said it was a Cadillac, some a Lincoln and some a Ford LTD. On the 18th of November, two days after she disappeared, Carmen was found. Her body was discovered partially nude in a gully between two boulders by two teenage boys about 12 miles from where she was last seen, running down the side of the expressway. She was fairly close to a village called Churchville. As is always the case, they actually thought Carmen was a doll at first before realising that she wasn't. Her coat was found about 300 foot away from her body and her trousers were discovered 12 days later close to a service road where she was seen running away from her abductor. The autopsy would show that Carmen had sadly been raped, she was covered in fingernail scratches and she suffered a fractured skull as well as a broken vertebrae before being ultimately strangled and the killer strangled her from the front. She'd been dead for at least a whole day before she was found and it's thought that she hadn't been killed in the location where she was. The murder happened elsewhere and the killer carried her light body to where it would soon be discovered. The fact that Carmen had been able to escape her abductor even temporarily showed that this might not have been a planned murder but instead one of opportunity. Perhaps the murderer had been driving down the road, saw Carmen and decided to act on the spot. It's very unusual for children to ever be able to escape their captors in cases like this. I mean it's fairly easy for a grown man to overpower a child. So this probably wasn't somebody experienced doing this. Or maybe it was, and Carmen was just a real fighter. In the aftermath of the murder, the police scoured the town for clues, but never really had much luck. Five billboards were erected by the expressway by a group called Citizens for a Decent Community, which read, Do you know who killed Carmen Cologne? Please help before it happens again. It urged people to be secret witnesses, stating that no clue was too small and offered a $6,000 reward. Several potential suspects were interviewed in the months after the murder, but all of them were cleared. According to an incredible paper that I found online by a woman called Sarah Rose George called Little Deaths, My Investigation into the Double Initial Murders, Eight people of interest were questioned in the 24 hours after Carmen's murder, but none of them were promising suspects. That paper, by the way, is incredible. Sarah actually went along with investigators on a tour of the crime scenes in these murders. She questioned said investigators and actually looked through the case files herself. Plus, the paper is so well written, it actually reads like a book. It'll be linked down below. I recommend you go and read it. The Saturday after Carmen's body was found, the police received a phone call from a local department store called Sibley's. The call was to report some very strange graffiti found on a men's toilet door on the sixth floor. It read, I killed a 10 year old girl, who will be next? The area was dusted for fingerprints and photographs were taken at the scene. And of course, this could have just been an insensitive joke, somebody just being an arsehole at the expense of Carmen. Or it could have been genuinely written by the killer. We of course still don't know the answer to that. Just over a month after Carmen was found, the investigation team on her case was reduced down to just three people. For a while it seemed like this was a one-off murder, although parents around Bull's Head kept a particularly close eye on their children for a few months. 
But as tends to happen with the passage of time, with no more murders, the general public just started to forget about it. Or at least that was until 17 months later on the 2nd of April 1973, when 11-year-old Wanda Walkowitz disappeared from East Rochester, also while she was out running an errand. Wanda was a bit tall in the Carmen, she was 4 foot 7 and 77 pounds, with ginger hair and blue eyes, and just like Carmen, she also had some learning disabilities and was a special education student at her school. Wanda had been raised alone by her mother Joyce after her father had died, and Joyce struggled, turning to alcohol to help her through the hard times. As a result, Wanda had a lot more responsibilities on her shoulder than the standard 11 year old. On the day of her disappearance, Wanda visited Hillside Delicatessen to purchase a few groceries for her mother around 5pm, it was all stuff for dinner that night. She was wearing a white dress and her green and red checkered coat. Several witnesses saw Wanda leaving with a bag of groceries in her hand, and the clerks who served her would later say that Wanda had told them she was in a hurry. Similar to how Carmen was in a hurry on the day that she was taken as well. However, apparently Wanda was always in a hurry, so no one really thought much of it. But then she disappeared after leaving the store at around 5.15pm, approximately the time of day that Carmen also disappeared. Wanda seemed to just disappear into thin air, nobody saw her get into any car or saw anything at all. Three friends of Wanda saw her with her groceries on her way home, struggling to get the bag more comfortable in her arms. They looked away for just a moment, and when they turned back, Wanda was gone. It didn't take long for Joyce at home to realise that something was amiss, and an hour and a half later sent her other daughter to the store with a friend to ask after Wanda, but of course, she wasn't there. They also stopped at a couple of Wanda's friends' houses to see if she'd stopped into play, but again, she hasn't. Joyce reported Wanda is missing at 7.47pm, but they said that she should just look around the neighbourhood again and see if she could find her, so she did just that, and called back again half an hour later to report her as missing again. This time, luckily, the police took the report. Now, something that struck me as very interesting in this case is that as much as there was no sign of Wanda to be found, neither was there a sign of her bag of groceries. Say that she had just been grabbed and dragged into a car by a passerby, you would probably assume that she would put up some sort of fight or at least would drop the bag of groceries in her panic. Perhaps they would roll out across the pavement in the process. But there was no sign of any groceries and nobody recalled anybody picking up groceries from the pavement either or even hearing anything. If I had to guess, I would say that Wanda got into a car voluntarily placing her groceries on the seat alongside her. Investigators soon discovered that just the Saturday before, Wanda and a friend had been followed and chased by a stranger in the park who jumped out of the bushes. Joyce had known about this at the time and she became so distressed at the thought of these incidents being linked that she actually had to be admitted to hospital and be treated for shock. At the time, the police had come out to investigate but they found nothing. And we don't know whether these two incidents were linked or not, but I assume they were. If not, Rochester had at least two men intent on harming or at least scaring children out on the streets. It would be the very next day, the 3rd of April, when Wanda's body was sadly discovered, just west of the Iandacoit Bay Bridge next to a Route 104 access road. It was a town called Webster, and she was actually only discovered because something white caught the eye of a state trooper. It was Wanda's dress, still in her body, which was lying face down on the hillside, as she was discovered just 17 hours after her disappearance. It was thought that her body had simply been thrown over the railing at the top and had rolled down the hill. The autopsy soon confirmed that Wanda had been raped and strangled, but this time from behind with a ligature, possibly a belt. The fact that Wanda had been strangled from behind was of particular interest to investigators. Carmen had been strangled from the front, and the types of killers who generally strangle in front and behind are vastly different. From behind suggests some sort of space between the killer and the victim, the killer not wanting to look at their victim as they die from in front is much more personal. 
In Wanda's stomach, the medical examiner discovered custard. But according to Joyce, Wanda definitely hadn't consumed custard at home in the hours prior to her abduction. So this meant that her abductor had made effort to feed her before killing her, which again is very interesting. If you recall my video on the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murders, I think from May, you may remember something similar being done there. Anonymous witnesses were asked to call a number where they would be assigned a six digit number themselves. They were then instructed to include that number on a letter with their tip that they sent in to the secret witness address. In the case that their tip is the one that helped lead to the killer, then the person could be identified and awarded the money. This system entices people to come forward who wouldn't necessarily want to be identified, but would still want the reward money. 72 calls were received on this line in the first 24 hours of operation, and 200 by the Friday, most of which just described vehicles seen in the vicinity around the time Wanda went missing. Nobody actually saw anything. According to the book Nightmare in Rochester though, there was actually one interesting tip. Someone said how on the Saturday night, the same night that Wanda and a friend had been chased through the park, a man in the 1971 Ford LTD had tried to lure two 10 year old girls into his car. This man was described as about 30 years old, 5 foot 10, with a black beard and mole on his forehead, and he was wearing a long black coat. Could this be the guy they were looking for in connection with the murders? Another interesting lead soon came in as well, with an anonymous caller claiming to have seen a white man forcing a red-haired girl into a light-coloured Dodge Dart, using a knife between 5.30 and 6pm on the Monday evening. Of course, this was huge, and ads were put in the paper asking this person to call back with more information. But they never did. A second caller also described a similar car near where Wanda's body had been disposed of in Webster. So everyone was told to be on the lookout for a car of this description, but it never came to anything. In the coming months, Joyce would fall apart over the loss of her daughter, because of course when someone goes missing it doesn't just destroy the direct victim's life, it destroys the lives of everyone who loved them as well. A Dr. David Barry with the University of Rochester created a psychological profile of the guy the police might be looking for here, saying that the killer might tend to be a loner with considerable difficulties establishing sexual or personal relationships with adults. The need for human contact with somebody who won't rebuff them will impel them to initially approach a youngster. Girls in their preteens are very appealing for this apparently because they're unguarded, not cynical, and very pleasant. The type of men police should be looking for don't react appropriately to the kind of cues we're always receiving in social situations. They have this inability to back off to know what goes and what doesn't go in a social situation. They see the initial acceptance from the victim and that's all they see and they build this up in their minds to total acceptance. Perhaps once they've committed the crime, they feel empowered to do it again, craving that acceptance over and over again. It was later said by other profilers that this would have been an organised murderer, with details planned out well in advance and the killer taking precautions to ensure they leave little or no evidence. Perhaps the killer even stalks or watches their victim beforehand to figure out their routine, which may have been the case with Wanda. But this killer let Carmen escape, which certainly isn't very organised, although I suppose we all make mistakes. And none of the victims were really taking part in their usual routine at the time they were abducted. Maybe the killer just followed them around for days, waiting for a moment to strike. Not long after Wanda's discovery, the citizens for a decent community put up new billboards for her murder. They'd put on their billboards for Carmen for people to come forward before this killer struck again, and now he had. The billboard this time read, It happened again. Who killed Wanda Walkowitz? It advertised a $10,000 reward and the secret witness line, as well as telling people to write them with tips, assuring that their identities would be kept hidden. 
In the autumn of that year, a show called Eyewitness Crime featured Wonder Story in an attempt to get people to come forward with more information, but despite around 200 calls, there was nothing of use. Not long after that, a third girl would go missing. It was the 26th of November 1973 when 10-year-old Michelle Mayenza failed to return home from school. Michelle had had a rough day. She had spent that entire morning crying in the nurse's office because she was being bullied by another student who was making fun of her weight. Michelle and the bully had been forced to stay after school, meaning that Michelle's mum, Carolyn, was waiting outside in the car for quite a while and was holding up all of the other cars. A teacher had to come out and tell Carolyn that Michelle wasn't coming out yet, so Carolyn decides to leave and head back. She had actually left her purse in the shop earlier that day and decided she needed to go and pick it up. She thought that Michelle would be able to walk home by herself that day. She was a very good kid and could be trusted to make it home. She'd walked home before and had always been fine. That afternoon, Michelle left school around 3.20 or 3.30pm and started on her walk home. She was wearing a purple hooded coat, purple patterned slacks and knee-high black boots. Only for some unknown reason, she didn't head straight back home. She actually started walking towards a shopping plaza called Goodman Plaza and was even seen en route by her Uncle Phil, who stopped and asked her if she wanted a lift home. Michelle declined, it seems that she was feeling sorry for herself after the tough day she'd had and maybe she just wanted some time to herself. I think we all get like that sometimes. A classmate called Cynthia also saw Michelle around this time, corroborating Uncle Phil's story that she was walking towards the plaza. Cynthia was on the move herself, but 10 minutes later she returned to the corner where she'd last seen Michelle and this time saw her again. But now she was in a car being driven wildly by a man. Cynthia had to actually jump out of the way to avoid being run over by this car, but remembered clear as day seeing Michelle inside and even caught a good sight of the man driving. When Michelle didn't return home after school as expected, Carolyn started to worry, as you would. I can't imagine the pain of letting a child walk home from school and that just happening to be the day that something goes wrong. At 5.40pm, she reported Michelle as missing, reportedly almost unable to talk down the phone, she was so upset. Police would have immediately made the connection with the other two missing girls, it seems, and took this case seriously from the get-go. They canvassed the neighbourhood, questioned anyone who might have seen something, and started looking further afield as well, including ditches, the side of the roads, dump sites. Cynthia wouldn't immediately share what she'd seen that afternoon. It seems it had shaken her up and she was a bit scared to tell somebody. But she did eventually tell her mother, who contacted the authorities herself. Cynthia was very sure of what she'd seen and was taken seriously by the police, especially when another witness, a female driver, corroborated everything she said. Cynthia may be the only person to ever fully see the face of the man responsible for these crimes. Michelle's body would be found two days later on the 28th of November around 10.30am in a ditch off a road near a town called Macedon. She was discovered by the local fire chief who was driving his truck around town when he spotted something unusual and this would turn out to be Michelle. This was a quiet and rural area, there weren't many houses around this place and it was the obvious kind of place to be a dump site. Michelle's fully clothed body had once again just been dropped down into the ditch and had rolled down the hill before coming to a stop. Her coat was later found in another ditch not too far away. The same medical examiner was called in to conduct Michelle's autopsy as by this point the authorities were pretty much 100% sure that they had a serial killer on their hands. Just like Wanda, it was confirmed that Michelle had been raped and then strangled from behind with a ligature, perhaps a belt or a rope. It was thought that she had died on the same day she disappeared, the Monday, although a time of death couldn't be ascertained. She had bruises where she'd been beaten and semen was recovered from the scene. Semen was actually recovered from all three scenes and whilst the DNA from that wouldn't have been much help in the 70s, today it would be invaluable. 
What they could determine though from the semen back then was that the perpetrator of all three murders was at the very least in the same blood group. People are basically either secretors or non-secretors when it comes to semen. They either secrete blood into it or they don't. The killer here was a secretor in all three cases, suggesting there was likely the same person committing all three crimes. Likely, but not 100%. Remnants of a barely digested cheeseburger were found in Michelle's stomach and it was thought that she'd only consumed it about 90 minutes before her death. As we know, Michelle had never made it home from school that day, her mum hadn't fed her any cheeseburgers and neither had the school. Just like with Wanda and the mysterious custard in her stomach, Michelle had been fed by the person who killed her. He spent time with them, it seems, before he committed the worst of his crimes. Once again, authorities asked anyone with any information to come forward, and they did get some tips of interest in the midst of a thousand calls a day in the very beginning. An anonymous caller came forward to say that they'd spoken to a cashier who had seen a man in the shopping plaza's laundrette offer Michelle a ride home, and she accepted. Which is very odd to me, because Michelle had just declined an offer from her own uncle for a lift just minutes earlier. The man and Michelle apparently left together. But because this tip didn't come from the cashier directly, just from somebody who spoke to the cashier, it made it less concrete, and the cashier themselves never came forward. Another witness said that he'd seen a light-coloured car parked up near the dump site and had assumed the man had a flat tyre or something, so stopped to help. A chubby young girl was in the back seat, which the man acted very shady about, and the man told him he hadn't broken down. Could this witness have potentially been the second person to get a good look at the man responsible for these murders? Apparently this man was dirty, unshaven, with long fingernails, around 6 foot, 170 pounds, with dark curly hair, and a medium complexion. I'm not really sure what medium refers to here. A sketch based on this witness's memory was made and released to the public, but of course, nothing much came out of it despite many leads at the time. One security guard said that he'd had a strange encounter with a man who looked like the picture, asking the security guard if he knew of any recent developments in Michelle's case. This man was very weird and stuttery, but he grew impatient and left before the guard could even check the newspaper to tell him. Perhaps the biggest lead that investigators had come in in Michelle's case was that of a woman who said that on the day of Michelle's abduction, she'd pulled into the car park of a fast food restaurant called Carol's Drive-In in Penfield. Whilst this woman was listening to the end of a song on the radio, she did a bit of people watching as you do, and noticed that she was parked next to a light-coloured Plymouth duster with a young girl in it with a round face, just like Michelle. The girl in the car was alone, and when the woman eventually went into the restaurant, a man exited with food and drove off in the car. She gave detectives a description of the man and helped create another sketch, which was then released. This could of course mean something completely innocent, a father just buying dinner for his daughter, but it was assumed that the man would have come forward. He never did. And this matched with the fact that Michelle had recently eaten a cheeseburger. Over 50 investigators were put onto Michelle's case in the first days. Doors were knocked, people were interviewed, every lead was followed up on, but nothing bore any results. They spoke to local known sex offenders, anyone who even slightly resembled the sketches, and nothing. Eventually, the man who'd stopped at the side of the road to help down the apparent broken car came forward saying he'd actually spotted this man and the car in question again, and this time he'd written down the number plate. This number plate was traced to a man in his 20s who was interrogated for a really long time, but a search revealed nothing. This man passed a polygraph test, and phone records showed that he wasn't even in Rochester at the time of the killings. So, it was back to square one. Around this time, one pretty serious suspect did come out though, who some still may think could be the man. A 25-year-old man called Dennis Termini and a known local rapist. On New Year's Day in 1974, he abducted an 18-year-old woman and led her at gunpoint to a local garage. 
Luckily, a neighbour saw and called the police who intercepted, forcing Dennis to run. He was soon cornered and instead of just allowing himself to get caught, he shot himself in the head. This seems like a pretty extreme thing to do, doesn't it? I know abduction is still a very serious crime in itself, but he was intercepted here before anything actually happened. Would you really kill yourself over that? Unless you know there's some more serious crimes that you don't want to be discovered. Which absolutely seems to be the case here. Dennis had been known before to abduct victims from urban areas and take them to rural areas to rape them, mostly from the same neighbourhoods the Alphabet Girls had disappeared from. Dennis drove a car very similar to the one described by Cynthia and was placed by detectives in the area around the time Michelle disappeared. However, despite the fact that Termini was clearly a very dangerous man, there was no evidence that he was a paedophile slash interested in young girls at all. But something which I've neglected to mention up until this point is the fact that all three girls were found with white cat hairs on their body, which does suggest that their killer owned a white cat. What did they find in Termini's car? White cat hairs, of course. Now, of course, a lot of people have white cats, but that was just another thing to add to a long list of suspicion. Termini remained such a strong suspect that years and years later, in 2007, they actually got permission to exhume his body and test his DNA against that found at the crime scenes. I can imagine a lot of people placed all of their hope on this coming up as a positive match, but sadly, that wasn't the case. His DNA did not match. Or at least it didn't match the DNA found on Wanda's body. Over the years, the physical evidence in Carmen and Michelle's case have sadly disappeared. So could this Dennis Termini be considered a suspect still? I'm not too sure. Many people think he still could have had something to do with it, even though the DNA didn't match. One of the main questions in this case is how were these particular girls chosen as the victims? Was it just pure coincidence that all of the names were double initials? Or had the killer carefully stalked and chosen who he was going to take? When I first went into writing this script, I was honestly convinced it was just some kind of weird coincidence. But there's a small fact, or a big fact, which makes me pause on that. You may have already noticed, but Carmen Cologne's body was found in a place called Churchville, a sea. Wanda Walkowitz was found in Webster, and Michelle Mayenza was found in Macedon. The double initials were a huge coincidence as they stood, but also all being found in those specific places just seems like too much for me to brush off. Perhaps the killer chose the girls based on dump sites he'd already identified in the area, rather than the other way around. This seems like the kind of serial killer you'd find in books, doesn't it? A serial killer who simply picks his victims based on the letters their names start with. You'd think that nobody in real life would actually do that. But we've seen much crazier things. Perhaps this was somebody who had access to public records. But besides the double initials, there were plenty of other things that also linked these girls. All three were from Catholic families, and from what I can gather, attended Catholic schools as well, although not the same ones. They were all from struggling families, on welfare, living in poorer areas of the city. None of their parents were together, and they all had learning difficulties. I find myself wondering if in one of these areas of their lives they'd all met with a certain person, perhaps a teaching assistant in their special education classes or a social worker. It seems that all three girls went with little fight, perhaps easily agreeing to get into their killer's car. This suggests they might have known this man or at the very least recognised him. Or maybe he was a man in a position of power. Dennis Termini was a firefighter and I saw speculation that he might have used his uniform to get the girls into his car, perhaps saying there was a fire at their home, although of course he was not a DNA match. The general consensus is that without a doubt Wanda and Michelle's cases are linked, both definitely murdered by the same person. They were both strangled from behind with a ligature, both found fully dressed, dropped down into a ditch with little care and they are both fed not long before their deaths. Carmen's case didn't quite seem to fit with this entirely. 
other than the fact of the initials and her age and life situation. Of course, it could just have been that the killer realised the mistakes he'd made in Carmen's case and corrected it by the time he got to Wanda, but it could be that it was a separate person. Maybe the killer of Wanda and Michelle was simply inspired by Carmen's case and attempted to recreate it. I don't know, I'm not entirely convinced by this theory that Karma was killed by somebody else and I personally think it was just one killer, but it's definitely something that investigators have explored at length. But who did they think could be responsible for Carmen's murder if that was the case? Well, they actually had one big suspect in the form of Miguel Colon, Carmen's own uncle, the brother of her father, and it seems that he may have actually been in a romantic relationship with Carmen's mother at the time as well. Investigators looked into him from fairly early on in Carmen's investigation, as he was said to have recently purchased a car of a similar description to what was seen down the side of the expressway when Carmen escaped. So, of course, his car was searched, and it was found that the boot had recently been washed with a cleaning solution. The dealership confirmed that this would not have been washed in their hands, so it would have had to have been cleaned by Miguel. The search also turned up one of Carmen's dolls, which I'm sure at first they thought was something very suspicious, but family members confirmed that they'd all recently gone on a trip and Carmen must have just left her doll in his car by mistake. Two days after Carmen's disappearance, Miguel told a friend that he was leaving the country as he had done something wrong in Rochester. Two days after that, he boarded a plane back to Puerto Rico, showing no inclination to hang around to help his family deal with their grief. Investigators wanted to bring him in for questioning, but obviously they struggled to do so as he was now in a different country, and in the end, the FBI actually had to get involved before he turned himself over to the local authorities. In March 1972, he was extradited back to Rochester for questioning, well, I don't think investigators quite got what they wanted. He gave nothing away under interrogation, and despite being unable to provide any alibi for the date of his niece's murder, I mean, you'd like to think you'd remember a day like that pretty clearly, he passed a lie detector test, and there was zero physical evidence to link him to the murder. The rest of the Cologne family also refused to believe that he had anything to do with it, and he said that the reason he didn't come in for questioning sooner is because he simply didn't realise that he was wanted. The DA at the time was sure that he was the one responsible for Carmen's death, but there was never enough evidence or any evidence for a conviction. And from what I can gather, there also wasn't any evidence putting him at the deaths of Wanda and Michelle either. Miguel actually died in 1991 at the age of 44, when police were called to a domestic violence incident when Miguel was found to be acting erratically in the house he now shared with Carmen's mum. He actually shot both her and her brother, who both luckily managed to survive, but when the police got closer, he shot himself in the head and died. Of course, as he died in 91, they've never tested his DNA against that found at the scenes. Another suspect is a man called Kenneth Bianchi, who you might know better as one of the Hillside Stranglers. Between October 1977 and 1978, Bianchi and his cousin Angelo Bruno Jr. terrorised LA, killing 10 people together, whilst Kenneth killed a further two alone. Their victims ranged in age from 12 to 28 years old, some sex workers, and some from middle class neighbourhoods. They were each sentenced to life imprisonment, and Bianchi is actually still alive today. In all honesty, the connection here is very loose, and I don't think he's a particularly great suspect, but I'm sure if I neglected to mention him, I'd get some comments, because his name is brought up time and time again. The main connection is made because he actually lived in Rochester at the time, working as an ice cream vendor, and was later known for strangling girls in the same way that Carmen, Wanda and Michelle were strangled. He also drove a car very similar to the ones described as being driven by the suspects. Bianchi was obviously never charged with these crimes, but he was a serious name on the suspects list to his great dismay. He actually vehemently denies having anything to do with this case, and seems to have a real bee in his bonnet about being accused of it. He's repeatedly tried to get his name cleared to no avail. 
He, at his request it seems, had his palm print compared with that found on Michelle, and no match was found between the two. And you probably find yourself thinking, why does he care if he's accused of more murders, he's already been convicted of 10. But the fact that the alphabet murders involved young girls being raped and killed probably wouldn't do him much good in prison. Child sexual predators are the lowest of the low in prison, generally having to be kept apart from gem pop for their own safety. However, again, this doesn't quite make sense to me, as he was already convicted of rape and murder of at least one 12 year old girl as part of his Hillside Strangler claim, so I'm not really sure why he was so against being a suspect on this list. He offered his own DNA to do testing against that of what was found in Wanda and there was no match, so he was cleared of that murder, but he was still under suspicion for Carmen and Michelle. And even then, he still could have been involved in Wanda's death according to investigators. He's even written letters to the Rochester media protesting his innocence, he's done everything he can to prove he didn't do it. But then again, he is a serial killer regardless, so investigators have no real reason to trust him at his words. Eventually, years later, I think they did concede and cleared him as an official suspect. There was literally no evidence apart from a bit of circumstance, but that was it. The final suspect is an incredibly interesting one to me, and it's a man called Joseph Nato. In April 2011, 77-year-old Nato was arrested in Reno, Nevada for the murders of four women, all sex workers in California between 1977 and 1994. Each one of these victims had a double initial name, Roxanne Ragash, Pamela Parsons, Tracy Tafoya, and weirdest of all, Carmen Cologne. Yep, a 22-year-old woman with the same name as 11-year-old Carmen. He did also have at least two other victims not matching this pattern, Sarah Dillon and Sharia Patton. All of his victims were strangled, and it's thought that he may have had many, many more victims than just the six, but the most damning evidence of all is that he actually lived in Rochester in the early 1970s, at the time the girls were murdered. He was, of course, considered a suspect in this case, a person of interest, I should say, but frustratingly, his DNA once again does not match that found at Wonder's crime scene. Plus, attacking schoolgirls isn't the same as attacking fully grown women. I want to say he's a really good suspect in this case. The fact he killed another woman called Carmen Clone is almost too much, but it is hard to dispute DNA evidence. I've just realised I was saying Joseph Nato, his name was actually Joseph Naso, N A S O. The alphabet murders, or double initial murders, are still very much an open case with the Rochester police. In 2009, the local newspaper, the Democratic Chronicle, published a series of articles asking for any public information, to which 20 new leads did come through, but none of them led to any breakthroughs in this case. Perhaps they're looking for two killers here, or maybe just one. There are still so many questions. Why did the killer just stop? What happened to him? Was his need for killing schoolgirls suddenly satiated after Michelle's murder? Or did he simply just move on to other crimes, moving cities or countries? Maybe he was arrested and has been in the prison system all this time. There's no doubt that if the perpetrator is still alive today, he's now going to be an elderly man. Time is probably running out to catch him now and bring these girls justice. And I do wonder if the Rochester police have considered doing genealogy testing in this case, a la Golden State Killer style. I really hope they do, because I feel like that could lead to something big here. Thank you so much for tuning in today, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, guys.